All right. I'm super excited to be with you again. We were just with you a few moments ago, talking to Eric, talking to you about things like Apache Spark, running on Kubernetes and running on OpenShift. Now we're going to take it to a whole nother level. We have a real data scientist with us today. So Sophie Watson is going to walk us through what it means to be a data scientist using this technology and specifically using more of those Jupyter notebooks you saw earlier. So if you're interested in data science, what it means to be part of that profession, be part of that expertise, the technical expertise, Sophie is our expert. She is the person who's going to walk us through it. So I am super excited to have her today. Also, I'm going to point you guys to a, pres a, a, a presentation, a recording of a demonstration we did for Virtual Summit where we actually took Sophie on a journey, where we went from Cloudera to Anaconda, we did the Jupyter Notebook, we ran in a production, and we actually had a real sample application there we showed people, it was a lot of fun. So I'll send a link out to the chat on that in a moment, but we're about to get started. So at this point, let's turn it over to Sophie. Thanks so much, Ben, thanks so much. Um, so yeah, um, today I'm gonna talk about uh, how data scientists benefit from Kubernetes and OpenShift. We're going to see how containers ease the pain points of data scientists at all stages of the machine learning workflow, from starting out in interactive exploration stages in Jupyter Notebooks, which Bear mentioned and you might have seen in Eric's talk, and on to how container platforms also support you in creating a model that acts as a service that you can monitor in production. Well, first up, today we'll level set on what a data scientist actually does. Who are these elusive creatures? What does their work look like? What's their workflow? And this, this will allow us to identify pain points of their workflow. From there, we'll be able to talk about why container platforms, Kubernetes, and in particular OpenShift, make these pain points less painful. And then we're going to go on to see an end-to-end -end demo running on OpenShift. The demo is going to go from provisioning that exploratory interactive Jupyter Hub environment. We'll develop a model in Jupyter Notebooks, and then we're going to lean on the power of the platform to generate a model service. We're going to be using Tekton pipelines to go from a Jupyter Notebook to a serverless service, and we'll see how we can monitor that service with Grafana. Sound good? Sounds very good. All right. So let's start by talking about what a data scientist actually does. How do they tackle a machine learning problem? Well, in general, the process can be split up into these seven stages. So the first thing that you have to do is codify the business problem at hand and define, decide how you're going to define success. How will we know if we've succeeded? So the end-to-end -end demo we'll be running today is going to be running a fraud detection model. So if we think about the problem of detecting fraud, does success here mean that we identify every fraudulent transaction? Does it mean that we never block a customer's legitimate transaction because we thought it was fraudulent? There's a few different angles we can approach that problem from. And there's also going to be some business uh, metrics that we're going to want to track as well. For example, if you are the credit card company, how long do your um, employees spend on the phone discussing disputed transactions? So once we've decided how we're going to define success, we're on to data collection, data federation, cleaning, and getting that data where you need it. So I'm not going to talk about that at all today, but you should go back and watch Eric Erlinson's DevNation talk from earlier this morning if you want to see how you can do that on OpenShift. Now, a raw transaction from a credit card, that data, isn't something we can immediately pass into a machine learning model. If you pass rubbish to a machine learning model, you'll get rubbish out. So what we've got to do is treat that transaction. And this is called feature engineering. So we want to find the useful information in that transaction and encode it as a point in space. And you want, you know your feature engineering technique has been successful if these points in space are clustered together. So if you have all your fraudulent transactions clustered together in one region and your legitimate transactions in another region. This tells us we should be able to train a good model. Training a model is just allowing a model to learn the difference between which of those points in space correspond to legitimate transactions and which correspond to fraudulent transactions. And a machine learning model is really just a function. It takes in a transaction, 
computes that feature vector, that point in space, and it returns a label, in our case, either fraudulent or legitimate. So when we're training a model, we're tuning the underlying parameters of that function. And we're accounting for some other payoffs too, for example, how expensive is the model to run, how long does it take to run, and so on. Once we've got our trained model, we want to check it's working well. This is called model validation. And once we're happy with it, we are on to the fun bit, which is shipping it to production. Now, some data scientists are now responsible for putting their models into production. And production can mean different things to different data scientists and different companies. Um, but in general, you're going to want to find a way to put that model out into the public or um, not all of the public perhaps, and find a way that you can monitor that model and check that it's still performing well once we've you know, got past the initial training and tuning stage. So that's a machine learning workflow. And there's two points in here where data scientists have a bit of a struggle on the things. The first is that getting going stage, getting the interactive environment that you can work in and the second is that step from your model that you've trained and putting that into production. So when you think about the environment that you want to use that I would like to use as a data scientist to do my work, I want it to be self-service. I don't want to have to file a ticket with IT every time I want to do something. It's really important that data science is reproducible. You've got to be accountable in data science and be able to say why you did things and so on. So environments have to be reproducible. I also sometimes want to have to specialize hardware, right? I want to run on GPUs and I want to scale out my model training. So I need to be able to do all of these things really simply. And once I get my model into production, it should be really easy for me to monitor that and check how it's working. So luckily for us, container platforms, Kubernetes and OpenShift really solve a lot of these problems for us out of the box. So we've got our container images that are built up of layers containing everything that you need to get your application running. Um, and these make it really easy for you to do your data science as well. So in data science, reproducibility is key. If I decline someone alone one day and then the next day I give them a loan, that's bad, right? I want to know why I did it. I want to know that the same model is running the same uh, in the same time frame on different occasions. And so I can do that if I'm using containers and I've got my container images. Similarly, if you work in an audited industry, you want to be able to go back and say, hey, which model was I running then? Which model was I running when I declined that person's loan? And container images make it really easy to do that as well. You can also do things like back testing, check your model again that's currently running in production against the model you ran in production last summer and see how it's performing. So the usual benefits that we get from containers really help us out with data science. Now, as you know, containers are um, put together to create stateless microservice architectures. So we've got these lightweight stateless microservices and we can scale them up and we can scale them out. And in machine learning, this is a huge advantage. Suppose that one particular part of your pipeline is a bottleneck. So scoring or making a prediction is really computationally effective. Well, you can just run multiple versions of that um, scorer behind a proxy, behind a load balancing server, and your bottleneck is gone. Another thing that container platforms bring to the table is a simple way to maintain your deployments. So if you use a declarative deployment configuration, meaning that you describe the conditions in which your deployment should be running without giving it an actual recipe for how you get there, it means it's really easy to run your code anywhere. So I can run some code on my laptop and then after a while I can run it on the public cloud or I can go and run it on the company's VM, right? And it's going to perform in the same way no matter where I run it. So for machine learning, these application configurations make it really easy to run it anywhere. To test different parameters and test different approaches 
through reproducible methods. So the benefits that Kubernetes brings to a table for standard software engineering practice are really valuable for the machine learning work too. Right? But data scientists shouldn't have to become Kubernetes experts in order to get their work done. Data scientists want to work in the ways that they are used to, want to be able to focus on the things that they're good at and not have to worry about orchestrating containers or load balancing servers and so on. So data scientists like to work in interactive notebooks called Jupyter Notebooks. So this is an example of a Jupyter Notebook here. Jupyter Notebooks are made up of cells and so these cells can contain code or text and you can execute the cells and see the output in line. So you can see here some plots and some plots from the license functions. So this makes Jupyter Notebooks a really great communication tool and a really lovely environment in which to work and do data science. And we can run Jupyter Notebooks on OpenShift using Jupyter Hub. So this provides a self-service environment for data scientists. There's no need to file a ticket with IT. And we can have preset resource quotas and role-based access to make sure that the data scientist experience is as simple and as safe and secure as possible. We'll see some of the options that you can set when you deploy your JupyterHub server on OpenShift in the demo in just a moment. So JupyterHub on OpenShift is giving us this development environment and we're really benefiting from our container platform here without having to be container experts. But these Jupyter Notebooks don't look like traditional software code, right? They don't look like production ready artifacts. So we still need a way to bridge that gap from going from the Jupyter Notebook, that exploratory environment, through to a model service that we can monitor and deploy in production. Luckily for us, we can do this quite easily on OpenShift. So there's many different ways to do this, and we'll see one today. All it requires is a data scientist is running their notebook in Git. OK, so you've got to be committing your notebooks to Git. Now, many data scientists do use a lot of engineering practices like source control or continuous deployment. But this is changing. I've seen a trend and people are really happy to kind of get going with some of those in order to reap the benefits. So if you have a notebook in Git, uh, Kubernetes and the OpenShift experience makes it really easy to go from a notebook to a notebook that we know runs with all of its dependencies and passes any relevant tests that we need it to pass, and then automatically builds a notebook image that can be deployed anywhere or even automated straight into production. So I think with that, what I'm going to do is step through an end-to-end -end demo of building a fraud detection model on OpenShift. The demo is going to focus on this part of the workflow here at first. So we're going to see how to develop techniques in Jupyter Notebooks. We'll develop a feature engineering technique to encode our transactions data as points in space. And then we'll use another notebook to go ahead and train a model. What we're then going to do is lean on OpenShift pipelines to take those notebooks, extract the code from them and produce a model service. So this is going to be running as a serverless service using Knative so that we can scale it up if this is the bottleneck in our system. And we're going to see how we can monitor that service in Grafana. And we're going to do all of this through the eyes of a data scientist. So remember, we're not container experts anymore, right? We don't want to, we don't have to know every detail about Kubernetes in order to reap these benefits. So let's head over to the demo. Sound good? Very good. Okay, so if I'm a data scientist, which I yeah, am, surprise, um, this is what the start of my day might look like. So this is a Jupyter Hub interface. Now I'm logged into OpenShift, but I could access this Jupyter Hub uh, route, route immediately uh, just with the URL. And I'm going to go ahead and authenticate um, with my very secure password over here. 
I'm going to allow these permissions. And what this takes us to is a Jupyter Hub spawner. So Jupyter Hub allows people to maintain their own uh, service. And this is just a launcher, which is asking Jupyter Hub for a server. We ask for a server, we click a button and we get one. There's a few options here. So here we can select a notebook image. Now, a notebook image is like a set of libraries um, that we need to run the notebooks. And we can build one of these in OpenShift really simply. There's no need for us to actually get a Docker file out and start writing in Docker files. Next up, we've got some t-shirt sizing. So depending on what you're going to do, you can choose how many resources you think you need. And you can even go ahead and request a GPU if you want one. Now here we're loading in our Jupyter notebooks from a GitHub repo. Shout out to my colleague Will for uh, letting us use these Jupyter notebooks today. And if we were going to, um, so we're running on, um, we have our own uh, assistant volume um, here, which is where these notebooks are going to be loaded into. But if we did want to connect to some other type of storage, we could populate these sections here and do so. So I'm going to go ahead and click spawn and it's going to spawn a Jupyter server for me. Now that's going to take maybe 30 seconds or so. So if it does that, I'm just going to flip back to the OpenShift console and show you the operator that we're using today. So we're using here the Open Data Hub operator. So the Open Data Hub is a um, community project open source sponsored by Red Hat. And it's also this great operator. It has a one click deployment of everything that you need to do your data science. So with one click, I get Jupyter, Spark, which Eric told us about earlier, Grafana and Prometheus so that we can monitor and visualize how our models are performing. And there's loads of other great functionality that we don't have time to get into today. But go ahead and take a look at that. OK, so our Jupyter Hub server has spawned for us so we can go and have a look at these notebooks. So the first notebook we're going to look at here is the feature engineering notebook. So as I said earlier, feature engineering is where you take that data and you encode it as a point in space. So this is what our notebook looks like. We're loading in the data. And we're splitting that data into a training and a testing set. This is really important for model validation so that we can check our model is working well later. We're then going to go ahead and encode the information in those transactions into a numerical vector. Um, so there's different things that we're extracting here in this notebook. Um, we are extracting the merchant ID and we're actually hashing that to a bucket. So who did we have that charge with on the credit card? We hash that to a bucket. And we're also um, hashing the way in which the transactions were, sorry, mapping the way in which the transactions occurred. So was it manual? Was it a chip and pin transaction? Was it contactless? And we're using a technique called one hot encoding to transform that information into a bit in a vector. We're also looking at the time between transactions. So how long has it been um, since a user made a transaction? This is something that's often looked at in, uh, in identifying fraud. And we can do some visualizations. So we have some coloring here and actually it looks like the blue and orange dots aren't separating. So I might need to go and do a bit more tuning to try and get it so that the fraud are in one part of space and the legitimate are elsewhere. Again, not looking great, but this is my feature engineering pipeline. OK, and at the end of this notebook, I've just saved that pipeline. So I've built up a pipeline of everything that we're doing, the transformations that we're doing on those transactions and saved it as a pipeline here. OK. Next up, we're going to go ahead and train a model. So Bear, have you ever played the game 20 questions? I think so. Um, so 20 questions. Uh, is your favorite color blue? It is red. 
Uh, so that is a no. 20 questions. The key is we can only say yes or no. Oh, man, I already broke the rule. <laughs> is your favorite color blue? No. Are you older than zero years old? Yes. OK, so you can imagine in 20 questions, we've got a question and a node and then we're splitting on a yes or no answer. You either go left or you go right. And then you get to another question and you carry on splitting. Well, the model we're training today is a random forest model and it's made up of a load of decision trees. And a decision tree is essentially just playing 20 questions with our data. So our machine learning model is learning what questions to ask in order to be able to differentiate between the legitimate and the fraudulent document. So that is uh, what we've got going on here. So in this notebook, again, we uh, take in those future vectors from our pipeline that we saved at the end of the last notebook. And we then go ahead and train a model. And at the end, all I'm doing is saving that model. So this is kind of my exploratory environment. This is where I'm developing the model. I'm deciding what's work and what isn't. I can actually try out a few different models in a few different notebooks. We also tried out a logistic regression model here. But the next step is that hurdle to turn this, these Jupyter notebooks into an artifact that we can go ahead and monitor and put into production, right? We want something that looks like a real model. So that's what we're going to do next. And we're going to be using um, OpenShift pipelines. Now, in true Blue Peter style, um, oh, I guess you don't have Blue Peter in around the world, um, in like a cooking show here's one i made earlier so we don't want to wait for our pipeline to run we've kicked it off already but we can go in and have a look and see what this pipeline is doing so this is a pipeline we've got going here and we can have a look and see that it's got some parameters the first parameter is a builder image so that um builder image what i'm doing there is really taking someone else's container image expertise and making my own service without having to bug them, right? I haven't made this um, image myself, but I can use the image that they've created, which is a source to image build, um, and really use that to create my model service. And I've also passed in a list of notebooks so the first notebook in our feature pipeline is the feature engineering notebook that we saw. And the next notebook in that pipeline is the random forest model notebook, which we also saw. So what this is doing is it's taking in those. Um, it's taking in those the code from those notebooks, if we look at the logs it's actually extracting everything from the notebooks it's installing all the dependencies it's creating this image and then it's uh creating a k-native service for us so our model is deployed and you can see here if i just zoom out a little bit that we can now interact with this service if we go to this url here so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to head back to our notebooks and I've actually got this services notebook, which is where we're going to interact with the model service today. So I need to change the default host to be um, you are of our um, model service. And um, so that defines the endpoint from the service. And I'm just going to use a client library to interact with this service. So we've got one function here, which is scoring a transaction. So it basically takes in the details about that transaction and it puts them into a data frame. And we've got this uh, next score transactions function, which then takes the transactions as a data frame. It transforms them to JSON and posts it to the REST endpoint. Now, JSON and the REST endpoint are just implementation details for today. You don't have to use 
those two interfaces if you don't want to. This is a really flexible way to work, so you can use something else there. And we're then using the client library to make predictions to the REST endpoint. So you can see here, I scored a transaction. This is hitting the REST endpoint. This is my transaction input. So you can see, you know, this is how much it was for and so on. It was a contactless payment and um, it's being returned as a legitimate transaction. So we can go ahead and make some more predictions and have a look at these so we can see the output of them. Um, and because we know the truth, because this is a training set, we can compare the prediction for the truth. So we see it's doing OK here, legitimate, legitimate. We've got a little bit of an error there. So I might go back and retune my model. We could see. So one of the really nice things about OpenShift is that we can also publish metrics about this service. So like with a conventional microservice, you've got your standard metrics, um, like, you know, GPU time, CPU time, and so on. Oops, sorry. Um, but we can also keep track of the number of predictions of each type that the model is made. So this is a really good way to check how well your model is performing. If we know that we um, expect say 10% of all transactions to be uh, fraudulent and the rest to be legitimate and we monitored the number of predictions our model was making and the number of fraudulent predictions it was making significantly differed from 10% or started to change significantly that tells us something is going wrong so when regular software breaks it usually just spins an error right it breaks in kind of a predictable way but machine learning models, remember, they're just a function. They're just taking in a transaction and spitting out a prediction. So often they'll continue to do that, even though their performance might be getting worse. So by monitoring the type and the number of outputs we're getting from a model, this is an indicator as to whether or not our model is performing as expected. From there, we can go back and say, has the data changed? Has our model broken down? Has something changed in the feature engineering pipeline? But we don't want to just look as a data scientist. I don't just want to hit refresh on this get metrics function and look at these here. I want to monitor this nicely. And so these are Prometheus metrics that are being published. And the Open Data Hub makes it really simple to publish model specific metrics to a Prometheus endpoint. And so we're going to go and mod monitor those now. So I'm going to go over back to our OpenShift console. Um, I'm going to go into Roots. And when we did that one click deployment of the OpenShift console um, of Open Data Hub and the Open Data Hub operator, we got ourselves a Grafana um, instance. So I'm going to go ahead and create a dashboard. We're going to create a graph here. And we're going to pull our data from our user namespace. And what we want to plot is the sum of pipelines, predictions, total. And we're going to group these by app and value. So let's have a look at that. OK, so we can see our predictions that were made then within the model here. So we can see what's happening. Um, and we're going to change the legend font just to make that a bit nicer. So we've got ourselves the fraudulent transactions in green and the legitimate transactions in orange. So we can monitor those. And if we go back to this notebook, we can run some experiments. So what we can do is change the proportion of fraudulent data that we see over time. So we're going to run 10,000 transactions with 2% uh, fraudulent. Then we're going to go up to 10,000 with 10% 10 fraudulent, 10,000 with 3% 10, 10, fraudulent. And we should be able to see the changes in the predictions made by the model live in Grafana. So this will take a couple of minutes to refresh. But when it does, we can have a look. OK, so we can see a huge jump in the number of predictions that have been made. You can see here that this is really shut up all of a sudden. Um, 
And we can, yeah, we can see that things are changing here. Now, it's not easy to see that perhaps the rate of change has changed, but a really nice way to visualize rate is by looking at the log of these plots. So if the slopes of two lines are the same, it means they've increased by the same ratio. So for example, if two things double, then the slopes of their lines would be the same. And so here you can see that the slope of the green line is getting steeper compared to the slope of the orange line over time. And that tells us that our data has drifted, which is what we expected from that uh, experiment we did. OK, so what have we seen today? We've seen what data scientists do. We've seen how we can provision the Jupyter Hub environment with one click um, of the Open Data Hub and develop work in Jupyter Notebooks. And then we've seen how we can lean on source to image builds, um, text on pipelines, and the work that somebody else has done um, in to create that container image build technique um, to get a model service that we can then monitor in Grafana. So Bert, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass back to you. Awesome stuff. And, and, and Waleed was saying, come on, we need more likes, more thumbs up on that YouTube channel. And of course, subscribers as well. I did actually send a screenshot on to Waleed who was interested in knowing which specific operator you're using. It's the Open, Open Data Hub one. I do think, though, it doesn't show up on Operator Hub I.O. It only shows up inside of OpenShift. Have you noticed that? Oh, um, I have not. OK, I, I just went looking. But it is okay. it does inside of OpenShift. I sent a screenshot from one of my clusters on the wall. Okay. But I, I love the point that you made, though, and it, de it deserves repeating. Unlike regular software development, for those of us who build Java applications and build Python applications and build normal apps, if you will, regular old apps, those don't, those don't really decay over time in production so much. In other words, right. they expect certain inputs and they have certain outputs, while a trained model, if the data stream has changed slightly over time, right, that the model may be getting performing worse and worse and worse. And we're not talking runtime performance, like how long it takes to execute a transaction. We're more focused on the validity of the transaction, like fraud or does it approve the mortgage, like you said. So that, that's a pretty critical point. Yeah, um, I've just heard through the grapevine that um, apparently we're one pull request away from the Open Data Hub version 0.6 being operator being in operatorhub.io. Okay. okay. So that should be happening soon. Okay. Operator Hub IO. Now, I also went and looked on operator, uh, operator, sorry, Open Data Hub IO, too many yeah. O's here. And I didn't see like a specific tutorial on this model as a service thing you were just showing. Uh, there might, it might be there, but I couldn't find it. And it would be interesting if we have a doc just directly on the demonstration you showed. Otherwise, people can watch the video and, and get a feel for it. Do you, do you know of one? Well, yeah, I can, uh, I can point you to that after the session. Is that OK? One question was, does the cluster you're using, does it have GPU support? And did that matter for the demonstration you were doing? So no, the models we were creating did not need GPUs. Um, and the cluster that I was using didn't have access to GPUs. So if I had changed that number to 10 and asked for 10 GPUs, sadly, nothing would have happened. OK, OK. Now, a great question from Miguel. Miguel, who's working on the thesis, we saw him earlier. He wants to know, what is the best strategy to make predictions if you don't have any data at first? Hey, Miguel. Um, good luck on your thesis. Right. So if we don't have any data, we're definitely going to have to collect some data before we can start making predictions. Um, yeah, you're going to want to. And what I've seen is people, if they have, and he even asked a question about dummy values, things like that. So you at least have to make up some data to validate, you know, your, to run against your model to come up with your hypothesis and test that model. Right. That's right. So we use the data generator. Um, one of my colleagues built this data generator to generate the data that we're using here to simulate different transaction types. Um, I mean, obviously, there is a lot of open source data on the web, but it's hard to find um, transaction data because it's so secure and it's got so much personal information in it. So we made a generator to generate some fake data 
Now, certainly before we put this model into production, we would check how it would run on the real data that was streaming in. So luckily, Kubernetes makes it really easy to do these kind of A-B tests or blue-green deployments, and we could route some of the traffic to the model that um, we know was working okay, and then some more traffic to this new model that we haven't actually trained on the real data, just to see how it's performing. Okay, no, that's very good. We are actually over time, and I do know we have to kind of move on to other things. But, Sophie, I love this presentation. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I personally enjoyed it, learned a lot. I think this is a fascinating space of IT work, right, information technology work, that many of us who are more traditional software developers or more traditional Linux systems administrators, which is often what we have here on Detonation, what you showed us is absolutely fascinating. For those of you who actually saw Eric's session today and Sophie's session, be ready for next Thursday. We have two more sessions in the same area, one specifically on GPUs. I saw that question about GPUs. We're going to focus more on how, how to enable those within this Kubernetes cluster world. And also, Ioana is going to come back and show us more about Open Data Hub and what it can do. Thank you so much. If you have questions, feel free to uh, hit uh, Sophie on Twitter. I sent her Twitter handle out to you guys. Hit me up on email. You all have my email address, and I can route those on to Sophie. And then look at the URL that you've been sitting on, and there will be the slides there as we get a chance to update that page. But if you have questions, email me. Your suggestions, email me. Sophie, thank you so much. It was absolutely awesome. Thanks for having me.